Um, I joined DEC in 1977 and almost immediately walked into the culture of text adventures uh, on the large time sharing systems. Um, the particular one that was sort of sweeping DEC at the time was uh, Will Crowther's Adventure. Um, in fact, it was such a such a burden to the time sharing systems of the era that it had been banned from being uh, played during prime time. Well, there were no PCs. This is uh, five years before the release of the IBM PC. Uh, there were hobbyist machines like the Altair uh, 8080, but they weren't uh, usable and they weren't widespread. So at DEC, as, uh, which was a typically advanced computer company of the era, uh, most of the, the, the company ran on systems that were shared by many people simultaneously through a text terminal. And the system fooled each person into thinking they got dedicated service when in fact it was using the time between keystrokes and the time between printing characters to deal with somebody else. These machines were very expensive and there were relatively few of them. Uh, so the company, all the companies that had them, uh, were pretty jealous of how they were used. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is that there was no internet at the time. What there was was the uh, Defense Department's network, the ARPANET. And at that time, the ARPANET was run almost entirely on PDP-10 time-sharing systems. So that's another facet of the story that will come in a little later. I never saw the main machine. It was in a, a large computer room. It required special air conditioning. Uh, these machines are, uh, scale-wise, uh, the equivalent of today's mainframe computers. Uh, multiple cabinets, uh, disk drives that were smaller than uh, the flash cards you're using to record on were the size of washing machines and required uh, 208 power. So uh, imagine that, that your personal computer was upscaled to the size of an 18-wheeler truck and then downscaled in power and in computing capability to about what's, what's in a, a modern calculator. And that's what we, we had at the time. Well, games fell under the general category of the care and feeding of, of engineers. Um, it wasn't encouraged, but on the other hand, it was rec recognized by managers that engineers are in intrinsically attracted to games, um, to puzzles, uh, to the challenge of creating them. And while you say there are you know, legions of games for these machines, there are actually relatively few, probably fewer than three or four dozen. Uh, compared to the tens of thousands of games or hundreds of thousands of games that exist for PCs. Uh, so it wasn't exactly a huge and widespread nuisance. Uh, the main impact was uh, to, keep the machines, the, to keep the machines free for real operations during real business hours was to restrict the games to off hours. But of course, um, that's, that wasn't exactly what I personally was looking for. Um, you know, I had my lunch hour, I had my, uh, my, uh, my times to to want to play games, and I, you know, I sort of had this, I want to be able to do it on my schedule and not on, on a company schedule that says like 8 p.m. in the evening and after. So although we didn't have personal computers, we certainly had a lot of very small machines that were typically available all the time. They were uh, div uh, small PDP-11s, um, which were intended to uh, be used for engineering development or be used for um, individual projects, not time-shared, idle a lot of the time, much like today's PCs. So my thought was, uh, particularly after encountering Adventure and discovering that it was a Fortran program, and my background is Fortran programming, uh, to get it off the mainframe, off the time sharing system, and onto the smallest possible mini computer that was widely accessible inside of DEC, which was the PDP-11. Uh, because then anybody would be able to play it at any time. Uh, and, uh, of course, that included me.
Uh, plus, I was curious about the mechanisms. Uh, the, uh, adventure is, is not that hard a game to work out, the original text adventure uh, by Willie Crowther. But I was extremely interested in how it had been put together to get the effects it did. Uh, so I really wanted to, to understand them, and what better way to understand them to, than to port it uh, from uh, a large-scale environment to a small one. So that, that project, uh, I must have done that almost as soon as I got to DEC, because it was, it was finished certainly before I began working on Dungeon, and uh, I only joined DEC in uh, the summer of 1977. Uh, so it didn't take very long. It was already in Fortran. Um, the PDP-11 and PDP-10 Fortrans were not that dissimilar. Kent Blackett had done a lot of work in making the, making the whole program much more uh, modular and structure, uh, structurally portable. It was primarily a matter of clip and prune and, and then figure out some overlays, uh, which is something nobody would understand today. Uh, so that it could work in the, in, the, in the memory that was available. The goal was to run Adventure, which required a mainframe, on a computer that had 56 kilobytes of memory and um, about 280 kilobytes of, of disk storage, two, two eight-inch floppy drives. And again, the, the perspective is um, that's less memory than there was in the original IBM PC, and it is 4,000 times less than the amount of memory that Microsoft says is required to run Windows XP today. So these are, these are machines that today would, would be the equivalent of a fancy digital wristwatch. You know, in those days with uh, the energy, energy of being, being 30 and uh, uh, no management commitments, it was uh, possible to put in extremely long hours in the evenings working on this thing. The effects were achieved with an economy of means that I found um, extremely intriguing. So the, the code is extremely dense uh, in, in Will Crowther's adventure, very compact. The mechanism for input and output is, is quite simple, and yet it gave, for, for its era, a very realistic interactive feel. Um, in terms of, of relatively good expressiveness uh, on the input side, and of course this enormous vocabulary of messages and situational um, elements that it could reply with as you moved around the maze. Uh, the random elements uh, which contributed to uh, uh, lengthening the amount of time to solution were also done very simply. Um, and that as much as anything is what made it possible to port. Uh, there was one fairly complicated section uh, having to do with so-called magic mode, which I think Will Crowther had programmed to help him debug, that I had to clip out just for space reasons. And of course, uh, the hours command, which was there to restrict when it could be used, got clipped as well. Um, but other than that, it was, it was uh, the amount of work that was necessary for the compaction was... Uh, it was not extraordinary um, because it was it was a very economical uh, program to start with. It wasn't a multi-user game, and uh, this was part of the management structure for a time-sharing system, which was you know if if we were going into prime time hours, we we're going to shut down all the games, and there was a capability to find all the copies of the games and shut them down more or less simultaneously. Uh, that's that's as you say it's it's. Part of the culture of computing in the 70s that is now unfathomable. There had been nothing like it. Um, in, in my previous life before coming to DEC, I was uh, worked in a, a real-time and embedded software development operation. Uh, and uh, we just didn't have uh, the kind of interconnect structure in terms of being connected into the broader development community that brought games in. So when I got to DEC, the only game I had ever even heard of on a computer was Space War, the original PDP-1 graphics game, which of course was long gone because PDP-1s were gone. Uh, so this was, this was a startling new uh, um, 
idea that computers were recreational as well as uh, for running analytical instruments and planetariums and uh, elevators and all the other things I had been using them for. Uh, so in addition, although you can certainly find antecedents in things like Wumpus and uh, uh, it was at a level of sophistication for its day that that was unprecedented. Uh, the notion of having, of, uh, I realize this seems so trivial today, verbs and objects, of having responses that were situationally varied, um, the descriptiveness, and just the general richness of the whole structure um, had not been seen before. Um, and I think was a product of sort of the computer uh, uh, engineers meeting D&D. Um, uh, certainly, uh, even the idea of a, of a role-playing exploration game I don't think would have been feasible in, um, uh, six or seven years before that because the, the, the board game and uh, role-playing game hadn't really existed. The game was known as Dungeon at the time I met it and what happened was it drifted in from MIT via the ARPANET. Uh, the, uh, the MIT system that was being used to as its development base was called ITS, which stood for the Incompatible Time Sharing System, uh, which was a play on a much older MIT system called CTS, as the Compatible Time Sharing System. And there was a way to run it on a more conventional PDP-10 operating system called TOPS-20, of which there were a few, but only a few in deck. Most of them ran an older system called TOPS-10. And so it drifted in and, and as usual for a company, a relatively small company in those days, the word began to get around that there was this much more elaborate, much more interesting and complicated uh, puzzle, text adventure, problem solving game. And it was extraordinarily difficult to get access to it because, uh, as I said, the machines that even DEC owned that could run it were relatively few and far between. Um, and having just come off working with Adventure, I was, I was very eager to learn more about these, these games. And uh, when, I saw, when I saw Dungeon with its uh, full-fledged parser and its uh, uh, far more elaborate um, uh, descriptive mechanisms and just the general richness of the whole environment, it was, it was uh, very, very interesting to me to see it. And it was also very frustrating to play because access was limited. It was a hard game, much harder than adventure. Um, and it was incomplete at the time. It was still being elaborated by uh, Mark and Tim and, and uh, the rest of the MIT gang. Um, there was version skew going on between, between them and anybody else who was playing it. Uh, so the same idea occurred to me, which was, if it was on a small machine, I'd have access to it. A lot more people would have access to it. Um, and we'd know more about it. So uh, kind of without quite really understanding what was involved, um, I decided, well, I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll port it. Um, there were only a, f a couple of um, sort of uh, minor assumptions that, were, that weren't quite right in my thinking. The first is, of course, that it wasn't written in Fortran. It was written in an obscure variant of a functional language like Lisp that was called MDL, Model Development Language. And when I first saw the sources, it was like, what is this? Um, I just had no clue what I was looking at. Um, then the second thing is, it's a much bigger game. Um, the source pool, source size for um, uh, Dungeon at the time was probably five to ten times the size of the, of the adventure sources. Um, so the notion of trying to shoehorn this into a, the machine target I had, which was the smallest, most personal PDP-11 of the time, uh, was a bit more daunting. Um, 
And um, then the third problem was it wasn't done. It was changing all the time. Um, so, well, I didn't know any better. So I nonetheless decided I would do this. Um, I would do it in the only language, higher level language that I was really fluent in, which was Fortran. Uh, now C was certainly available, but there was probably not a single Unix system in DEC at the time. Uh, so Fortran was it. I bought a book on Muddle from the MIT Press and uh, started in doing some probe coding. And uh, this was probably in late 1977, or early 1978. And I would not have made a huge amount of progress except that in early 1978 there occurred what is fondly called the blizzard of 78 when 26 inches or so of snow fell on, on uh, the place in early February and the state was shut down for a week. Um, I was home. I was home with the printed muddle listings and the book and I didn't have anything else to do at the time. So uh, during that week I fundamentally worked out how to represent the data structures and the algorithms in, in Fortran from the sources I had. And I did a probe-coded uh, version of the game with, with no parser. Um, but nonetheless, if you could type in, uh, you could basically type in numeric equivalents for a command and then it would go off and it would, it would do the game action. It would uh, uh, display rooms and do actions and the pirate would show up, uh, the, excuse me, the thief would show up and cut your throat and all the good things it's supposed to do. Um, when I had this running in, in, uh, in uh, March of 78, uh, I made contact with the guys at MIT and said, hey, you know, it's possible to, to run this um, on a much smaller machine. Uh, do you, would you be interested in supporting this by actually, you know, giving me giving me the complete source set as opposed to the fragment that I had. Um, they came out to the to where I was working, and I was actually working right across the divide here in in the other uh, uh, building. And they were completely astounded to see that what they regarded as a mainframe large scale program was running on this this from their point of view tiny machine. And uh, they agreed th to provide the full source set so that I could port as much of the game as existed at the time. So for, for uh, really over the first half of 78, um, I finished off an initial complete implementation and put that out in DECAS. Um, their one condition was that the uh, the big database file, the text file that sort of had all the strings, couldn't be uh, published in, in um, unencrypted form. And then, uh, basically as new inputs came in, as they finished the end game and uh, so forth, I kept, kept up with what they were doing for about the next 18 months. Um, but at, at that point, uh, there were several interesting, interesting developments that sort of uh, brought my, my uh, participation to an end. Um, one is the fact, the, the fact of showing them this running on a small machine uh, helped convince them that there might be a business there. Um, if I could put it on a, on a PDP-11 with uh, 56 kilobytes of memory, then why couldn't one put it on a um, TRS-80 with 64 kilobytes of memory or whatever it had in the day? And they went um, into business. They founded Infocom uh, to fundamentally um, exploit what they'd done. And uh, at that point, the, you know, the status of this sort of uh, in the wild version became, from their point of view, a little problematic. So we talked about it for a while, and ultimately the solution uh, kind of emerged from a usage realization, which was that people who had access to PDP-11s uh, 
and people who were running personal computers at home and would be buying games were two completely divergent populations. Uh, there were only probably at that time a few hundred thousand PDP-11s in the world and they were all, um, almost all, doing embedded work. So aside from DEC itself and maybe a few other places, there wasn't going to be a large audience for the PDP-11 version and it was not going to cut into their commercial sales. So the, the arrangement we reached was their copyrights went on everything in the dungeon sources and the dungeon sources went into DECAS, uh, which is Dex, uh, was Dex user group. Um, and they retained the exclusive commercial rights and off they went. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, they, they, the, the four guys who wrote Dungeon were really tight with each other. I mean, they worked at MIT. They were, uh, I believe, in the AI lab. And um, they were also... Uh, at that point, uh, half a generation younger than I was. So, in addition, I was I was myself um, uh, new, uh, a new father. Uh, I was just moving into a f to what would become my main career at DEC, which was uh, the development of uh, VLSI microprocessors. And if the subject had come up, it wouldn't have lasted more than 30 seconds. I was already beginning to regard myself as a hardware engineer and a hardware engineering manager, not a software engineer. Uh, and uh, re really, the discussions we had were mostly, almost all confined to two things. One was the development of the game itself in terms of where, where they were going and, and what, uh, what kinds of features uh, they were going to add and what impact that might have to my much more constrained environment. And then um, working through the legal issues on the copyrights and, and coming to an agreement about that. Because uh, they themselves, I presume, had some complexity in getting the game out of MIT because MIT would have regarded it as, as uh, having been developed on MIT time. But that all, that all got sorted out and, as far as I know, without a lawyer ever being involved. Um, yeah, in, in, uh, Infocom was, of course, quite successful. The engine they developed, uh, which I think is sometimes called the Z-Machine engine, um, they were able to make many more adventures uh, and games out of it uh, beyond Zork. Um, got bought by Activision. Activision republished the trilogy uh, as a sort of a classic game. Uh, and it had a, had a really good run in, in the 1980s. But by the end of the 80s, graphics games were, were it. PCs were everywhere. And there was no... Um, It had already become um, a historic game. I mean, I did the last version for the PDP-11 in 1980, and at that point, I had exhausted every spare byte in memory. Uh, there was just no way I could keep up with where, where they were going. And they elaborated the game for at least two more years before sort of freezing it and, and uh, going on exclusively to Infocom and Z Machine. Uh, in 1990, I was now running a, a program inside of DEC called Alpha, which was developing DEC's 64-bit risk technology. And at that point, um, for the first time, I wasn't managing a large group for the first time in 10 years. Uh, so I uh, happened to come across the games again uh, and realized that they were, from the point of view of 1990 software, they were pretty crufty. To, to squeeze them in on the PDP-11, I had used all kinds of ugly techniques uh, like uh, encoding the strings in Radix 50 and, and bizarre stuff like that. Um, and in the era of the 1990s with 32-bit processors and uh, a few megabytes of memory and, and disks that were you know, like a gigabyte, I could really unfold the game's structure, make them much cleaner and more portable and coincidentally uh, create a standard regression test for our Fortran compilers. So in 1990, I took the, the PDP-11 code and fundamentally did a scrubbing pass uh, to simplify the structures, uh, restore any features that I had missed. Uh, and in the case of, of Dungeon, um, to pick up the last couple of years of development that Mark and Tim and the rest had done that I had never been able to do. Um, 
So I published a new source set in 1990 for both Adventure and Dungeon um, that represented, at least for, for Dungeon, as close a replica as I could do to the final model source. Um, every puzzle, every game, every quirk, um, and uh, uh, one tiny addition. There's one tiny addition in that set uh, compared to uh, uh, the final model source. And that became, because it is, it is a large uh, Fortran program that uses Fortran in a fairly unusual way with lots of strings and so forth, it became the standard regression test, or one part of the regression test for uh, our Fortran compiler and for eventually for our Unix Fortran compiler. But the other thing that happened as a result of cleaning up the source is that it became accessible to, in, to the new Fortran to C converters that had started showing up in the Unix world to help people uh, cope with the fact that in, at least in that era of Unix, there were no Fortran compilers or no good Fortran compilers. Um, so people began running both Adventure and Dungeon through the Fortran to C converters and at the end, they had truly portable code. Unreadable, but portable. And it's those C versions of Adventure and Dungeon that basically now populate the universe of, of, of uh, these things. I was astounded that uh, we're, we're, we're building an embedded control plane application here on UC Linux. And uh, on this relatively tiny microprocessor and, and the, the developer booted up the, the UC Linux board and the first thing he found there was Adventure. And suddenly we had Adventure running on our network again in 2006. <laughs> on the dungeon port, there's one, as I said, unique feature that got added very late compared to the model version. Um, and on the Adventure port, you can tell because uh, if the magic mode in our stuff is not there, then it, and it's still exactly 350 points, then it's a derivative of that source. Um, Adventure, unlike unlike Dungeon, Adventure got elaborated 15 ways from Sunday, and there's about some unknown number of versions, some with point totals up in the 500s. Mm -hmm. uh, but the original 350.1 without hours and without magic mode derives from the PDP-11 slash back source. The deeper answer is I am strongly committed philosophically to the belief that the past informs the future. Not just in uh, terms of history of, of human beings, but even in engineering. Uh, there's an interesting phenomenon in bridge building that major bridge disasters seem to come every other generation. And the belief is that it is the loss of the folklore and the accumulated verbal wisdom of two generations back uh, that somehow contributes to a newer generation not quite knowing where the limits are. And that's certainly true in computing. I have found that, that young software engineers uh, not being conversant with how computing developed and what the techniques are, are often reinventing things that, problems that have been solved decades ago. In addition, based on something Gordon Bell likes to call the wheel of reincarnation, computing problems never really go away, they just simply show up in new forms. So I've often had people ask me, what's the relevance of studying how programs were crammed into 64 kilobytes of memory? Well, the answer is this modern Pentium 55 or Athlon 96 that you have that runs at 3 gigahertz only runs at 3 gigahertz if the program fits in its first level instruction cache, which is 64 kilobytes long. If it fits in the second level cache, you've got a 300 megahertz machine. And if it doesn't fit in cache, you have a 30 megahertz machine. So if you're actually interested in the problem of making your computer system fast, then you better study how people made programs small. 
if you're interested in understanding uh, the evolution of operating system technology, would you like to understand or be able to have some knowledge of how Unix developed from its roots on a PDP-7 in 1967 out to today? Uh, if you'd like to be able to uh, follow and be cognizant of the, the development of database technology uh, or user human interaction technology, uh, wouldn't it be good to be able to go back and see firsthand how it worked? And of course, if you're interested in computer games, wouldn't you like to play them all the way back to Space War? So, uh, there's a recreational aspect to it, there's an educational aspect to it, and there's a, a almost a kind of a duty to posterity aspect to it. Uh, that keeps me engaged, um, uh, along with, a, I must say, and give full credit to a small group of worldwide fanatics um, on the Internet, most of whom I have never met. Uh, without the Internet and without the resources it brings to bear, this would never be possible.